Today we are in Psalm number 18. And we begin our study in verse 22. And Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to the word that we're about to study. In Jesus' name, amen. Actually, I want to begin reading in Psalm 18, verse 20. David says, The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me and I did not put away his statutes from me. Now, David says, I did not put away God's statutes from me. A sincere man or woman of God may be drawn to a particular sin. They may be guilty of committing a particular sin. But they do not try to blot God's law against it out of their mind. Like David, they do not put away God's statute. In other words, they don't pretend that that sin that maybe they have a struggle with is okay. 23. I was also blameless before him, and I kept myself from iniquity. Blameless does not mean sinless. A blameless Christian is one who sincerely wants to please Christ and repents and confesses any sin that he may fall into. 24. Therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. God rewarded David for his commitment to him. Verse 25. With the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. The Bible says that God desires mercy. It is what he wants. He wants us to be merciful towards each other. And so if we are merciful to others, we are being good to God because that's what He wants. And if we are good to God, He says He will be good to us. In the last part of verse 25, With the blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. God only punishes those who have it coming. He does not punish the blameless. He can never be blamed for doing that. Verse 26. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. Now, none of us are pure by nature. But those who receive Christ are the only ones who are actually pure to God. We are pure to God in position. We are made pure by the death of of Jesus Christ which paid for our sins and God shows himself pure to the Christian by making that Christian pure as a gift 26 last part of it and with the devious you will show yourself shrewd devious refers to stubborn perverse twisted sinners whose ways are crooked and are contrary to God's ways and people like that the devious will find out that God will do things to them that are contrary to what they like 27 for you will save the humble people but will bring down haughty looks Humble people are those who see themselves as God sees them. And they regret where they when they fail. And humble people not only regret when they fail, fail the Lord that is, humble people often suffer for doing what is right. 
God assures them that in his own time, he will save them out of all that bad. If not in this life, then for sure in the next one. 28. For you will light my lamp, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop, by my God I can leap over a wall. With God on your side, you can beat the odds. You let the Lord lead you by staying in His moral will, and you will beat the odds. Let the Lord lead you by staying in His moral will, and like a snowplow, He will clear a path in the direction that He wants you to go. 30. As for God, His way is perfect. I like this. The word of the Lord is is proven he is a shield to all who trust in him the word of the Lord is proven the word of God is free of all errors it is clear it is pure and that's why God says do not add to my word or take away from it adding to or taking away from God's word taints it it's fine just the way it is Just leave it alone. 31. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? There is one God, and He is the God of this book. He is the Creator. His name is Jehovah, and His Son's name is Jesus. Who is God except the Lord? That is who God is. 32. It is God who arms me with strength. God will strengthen our bodies and He will also fortify our minds so that we can do what He asks us to do. Even when it's not easy, He gives us the strength, mental, physical strength, to persevere. The last part of verse 32 and makes my way perfect. Not perfect morally. David would be the first to admit that he was not perfect morally. Perfect here means safe or successful. When you let God lead you, He will lead you to victory. When we, like I said in the past, when we take up His cause, He will take up our cause. 33. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and sets me on my high places. God says, I will make your feet like the feet of a deer. Deer are not clumsy. I will never forget, probably about mm, ten years ago, I was studying this passage, getting ready to teach it. And I'm in my house, and it's the middle of winter, and this house is right in the middle of town. And I read this verse, He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. And I thought, and I prayed, God, what does that mean? How am I, what am I supposed to say about this verse? And I just finished praying that, and I looked up out of my window here in the middle of town, and there was a deer in town, right across the street from my house. And he was walking on, on ice and snow and and he was so graceful. And I thought, what are the odds of a deer being in the middle of town the second that I look up right in front of my window after I just read this verse and prayed and asked God to show me what it means? The odds of that are impossible unless God has directed it. And he showed me as soon as I saw that deer, I, after I got over the amazement of seeing a deer... And what was going on, I saw how graceful he was, and I thought, there it is. God just showed me what I was supposed to say. Deer are not clumsy. And so God is saying, I won't let you fall if you stick with me. I will not let you stumble spiritually if you hang tight with me. Now, it may not always be easy, but God says, I'll keep you going. 34. He teaches my hands to make war. 
so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. Sometimes God helps us by a miracle. More often, He simply gives us strength and wisdom to do what we need to do. But either way, whatever method God chooses, He deserves the credit, that is for sure. 35. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great. The shield of your salvation. The salvation that God gives us through Jesus Christ is a shield. In other words, it protects us from anyone or anything that would keep us out of heaven and send us from hell, have sent us to hell. 36. You enlarged my path under me so my feet did not slip. I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn back again until they were destroyed. I have wounded them so that they could not rise. They have fallen under my feet. For you have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. You have also given me the necks of my enemies so that I destroyed those who hated me. They cried out, but there was none to save, even to the Lord, but he did not answer them. Then I beat them as fine as the dust before the wind. I cast them out like dirt in the streets. God gave David his enemies. He gave David's enemies into his hand, and David made the most of it. David beat them to powder. He beat them like the dust. And you know what? That's what God wanted him to do. If David doesn't do it, well then it's not God's fault if he doesn't enjoy life because God gave him his enemies into his hands. It was up to David to destroy those enemies and it's the same with us spiritually speaking. Our enemy is the flesh, is the world, is the devil. But we need to beat the tar out of our sin nature. God has given it into our hands. He has given us the means to be victorious over our sin nature. It's up to us, though, to beat it to dust. Meaning, don't give in to it, because you don't have to. And we can never be happy as Christians unless we determine to squash our sin nature by the power of God. 43. You have delivered me from the strivings of the people. You have made me the head of the nations, a people I have not known shall serve me as soon as they hear of me they obey me the foreigners submit to me the foreigners fade away and come frightened from their hideouts the evidence of God working in David's life caused others to respect him maybe they did not like David but they had to admit that whatever he had it worked 46. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God who avenges me and subdues the people under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name. David says, I'm going to give thanks to you among the Gentiles. The Gentiles are those who do not know God. David gave God credit for all of his success, for anything positive that he had. And David gave God that credit. He did it in front of those who did not know the Lord. Christians are supposed to be witnesses to the reality of God in this world that is filled with people who rarely, if ever, think about God. Fifty, great deliverance he gives to his king and shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forevermore. The one that God chooses to be king is protected by God. That's what he says. And that's talking about David for sure. God saved David out of many tight spots. The one that God chooses to be king is protected by God. It was true of David. 
It's also talking about Jesus Christ. How did God protect him? God raised him from the dead. Jesus will return to earth and he will be king of the world forever because God delivered his king. Now let's go to Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Firmament refers to the sky. And you can tell a lot about a person by way, what they like to do and what they like to make. It tells you something about their personality, their likes, their dislikes. Same with God. God is a very skilled craftsman. And when you look at the sky, whether daytime or nighttime, doesn't matter. You see just a small sample of His handiwork. Look at what He has made. In the sky, you can tell from what he has made that he is very smart, very orderly, and very powerful, too. Two. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. Every day and every night, the sky delivers a sermon. It says, Attention to everyone on earth. There is an all-powerful, very wise God out here, Verse 3, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. The sky's words are not spoken out loud. Literally, this verse is there is no speech nor language. Their voice is not heard. And so, yeah, the sky preaches a sermon, but not audibly. But it's real. Verse 4, their message has gone out through all the earth. And their words to the end of the world. So, the unspoken words of the cosmos, the unspoken sermon in the sky, it is heard all over the world in every language. And everyone hears the same message too. It is, you are here because I have made you and you are accountable to me. And the last part of verse 4. And then he has set a tabernacle for the sun. And I'm glad too. I'm glad that God was in charge of where the sun was. I'm glad that it wasn't by accident that it landed where it did, because that means it could move. God put the sun right where he wanted it, and it's a good thing God knew what he was doing, because just a few miles closer, and you know, we all burn. We're a few miles further away, and we all freeze. It is no accident that the sun is exactly where it, where it, where it is right now, because God put it there talking about the sun in verse 5 which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race a bridegroom coming out of his chamber would radiate happiness and make everyone who's with him feel good too and it would have that effect and that's the same effect that the sun has on people when they see it rise I don't know anybody who gets depressed when they see a beautiful sunrise It makes you feel good. If only for a moment, it makes you feel good. God created it to be that way. And the sun, according to the Word of God, is also very strong. It says here, rejoices like a strong man to run its race. The sun is strong, powerful. It's been running its race. It's been running its course for thousands of years. And it hasn't lost a step. Hasn't grown tired one bit. It's still going at the same speed. Six. Its rising is from one end of the heaven. And its circuit to the other end. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. You can hide from the sun's light, but you you cannot hide from its heat. The sun's heat is everywhere. You can't really run from that entirely. Even if you stood in a refrigerator... Whether you know it or not, the sun's heat is having an effect. It's just here. Verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting or reviving the soul. When you are down, read the Word of God. It will revive your soul. Now, it might not happen immediately, But keep at it. It will happen. 
Last part of verse 7. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. You get more wisdom from reading the Scripture than you will from all the other books of the world combined, guaranteed. Verse 8. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Our sin nature wants to do wrong. But if you want to rejoice, if you want to be happy, if you want to feel good, then do what the Word of God says is right. The Word of God is right. Doing Scripture is right. And no one can feel right unless they first do right. Last part of verse 8. The commandment of the Lord is pure or clear. The commandment of the Lord is clear. Enlightening the eyes. Some people are always looking for hidden, mystical, or allegorical meanings to God's Word. You know, some so-called deep interpretation. And that always sounds that always sounds very spiritual. But it is wrong. Because the Word of God is clear. God meant what He said. Just read it. And accept it as it is. Nine. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. One reason God made His Word so easy to understand, so clear, is so that we would understand Him. And as a result, as verse 9 suggests, have a healthy fear of Him. Because the more the Word you take in, the more respect you will have for God. The last part of verse 9. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The judgments of the Lord refers to the rules by which He governs His people. They are the best way to go. His judgments, His rules are the best way to go. Because they are in line with God's holiness. And because they are right. Which means following them will be much better for us in the long term than following our own plans. 10. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. God's word is much better than wealth or good food. If you are a Christian who loves God, then the word of God will be the most valuable thing you possess and you wouldn't trade it for anything in this world. 11. Moreover, by them, your servant is warned. The more you are in the word, the sharper your conscience will be. Warning lights will flash in your soul when you even begin to think about doing something that is not right. Last part of verse 11. And in keeping them, there is great reward. The joy and the changed lives for the better are just a couple of the built-in rewards that come from reading and applying God's Word. 12. Who can understand his errors? No one. And God never tells us to try to understand our errors. God never tells us to try to figure out our sin. We try to figure out why a sinner does what he does. There's no figuring it out because sin is illogical and you cannot understand something that doesn't make sense. God tells us to punish wrongdoing, but he never tells us to try to figure it out. Last part of verse 12. Cleanse me from secret faults. Every Christian probably has his spiritual blind spots. Sins they commit without even knowing it. And it is good to ask God to show us if we have any of those. And if we do, ask Him to take them away. 13. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. 
Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. One of the dangers of presumptuous sins, that is, sins that are planned, one of the dangers of planning sin and then doing that sin is that those sins can get dominion over you. And that's why he says, don't let me do presumptuous sins. Don't let them have dominion over me. That means being hooked on sin. You do it once, and it's easier to do it the second time. You do it the second time, and it's easier to do it the third time. Before you know it, you are hooked. People say, I'm addicted to this, and I'm addicted to that. My counselor says it's a sickness. It is not. Not if it's sin, it is not. It is not a sickness. Having the flu is being sick. People talk about being a drunk as a sickness. That is contrary to the pure word of God. That is an insult to anybody who has cancer. I read a story last week about a woman in the UK who killed her two little children, four and five years old, I think they were. And the authorities there have concluded that she has a rare mental sickness. She's sick. She desires to get attention for herself by being mean to others. She is sick. That is a hideous sin. It is a sin of murder. And if she has given over to that, she has allowed that sin of murder and selfishness to get dominion over her. Or we need to use biblical terms to describe biblical things. And the way to get out of that mess is to repent and pray and fast and keep on fasting until God breaks that habit. Praise God, fast, pray, repent, until God helps you to snap that habit. And that means work. And that takes dedication. But God can give you the victory over any habitual sin. 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. And I'm not going to add anything to this except to say, that this is a great thing to pray to God every single day. And I will close today's message by praying it for all of us. Father, let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight, 